so we can get a person well from asthma, so they never have to have another asthma attack the rest of their life. If we fuel the body with nutrients, and allow the body to finish its activities, we can let the body's headache never have a headache again. We can never we can make it so they never. But what what happens now is that people finish a meal and three or four hours later they start to feel agitated, shaky, or fatigued, and they think they got to keep eat again to keep their energy up. So they don't relate, and the dietary industry has fueled that to think that, you know, has tried to, we can't diet, we can't lose weight because just willy-nillying reducing calories makes us feel worse. That's like telling a person to breathe less oxygen. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Wellness at the Speed of Light podcast. I'm your friendly orthopedic spine surgeon host, Dr. Stefano Sinecropi, and I could not be more excited today to have Dr. Joel Furman, who is a voice that absolutely must be heard. You need to listen to this episode until the very end. Dr. Joel Furman has been really on the cutting edge of the way we need to be thinking as a medical community about making radical changes in, in healthcare today. Those of you that follow me uh, regularly know that I've made a massive transition in, in, away from my silo in being a hardcore Western trained spine surgeon into somebody that really deeply believes in the power of lifestyle medicine, functional medicine, nutritional changes, preventative medicine as ways to radically change the healthcare system. And, and Dr. Uh, Furman is the guy really to listen to on this. He's heavily published. He's got some incredible books out there. He's got landmark papers. We'll get into all that in a little bit. But on that note, I want to welcome Dr. Furman to the show today. One quick thing, he's also a fellow New Yorker, and that always makes it super special. So welcome to the show today, Dr. Furman. Thank you. Looking forward to this, having some fun together. All right. Fantastic. So I always like to, you know, start with, with something that's near and dear to my heart and something that, that I kind of repeat over and over again. We're staring right now at a $4.4 trillion per capita, I mean, I'm sorry, $4.4 trillion spend in what I would consider mostly sick care in the United States. Um, we spend per capita more than anyone else in the world on our citizens, but yet every major chronic disease is sadly on the rise and only make an... an the fact that this is not alarming to more is very concerning to me, but I'm going to start with a really broad question to you. What is wrong with the state of the current healthcare system, and how did we get here? Well, I'm not claiming to have all the answers to that question, <laughs> because that's a long hundred-year history of how this evolved. But we know that I always make the joke. I say the standard American diet has been designed by Al-Qaeda. And the reason why I say that is because if we put the top nutritional scientists together at a conference and we try to make a diet more deadly, more cancer causing, more heart attack causing, we couldn't design it better than the American diet to include all the elements that accelerates aging, that lays down atherosclerosis, inflammation, the causes of cancer, and the causes of dementia and premature aging. So we pretty much designed the perfect witch's cauldron of ingredients to kill people prematurely. And the foods we've designed that people love to eat based on the socialization, based on you know, the process of trying to sell people products and want your product to sell the best. And food science has advanced to the point where you can make your products highly addicting. And, the, and most Americans are, I could say, I, I think almost all Americans are heavily and strongly addicted to the caloric rush of processed foods and that they don't feel satisfied with the normal amount of calories because the brain has you know, been, been overly compensated and the, the neural networks of the brain have rewired themselves and the neuroplasticity and the, the dopamine sensitivity. We can talk about all the chemical, how it works chemically, but the point I'm making right now is that we're eating ourselves to death. And, so, and then we go to a doctor because we have a lifestyle and diet induced medical problem like headaches, asthma, hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, 
fatigue, we have a medical problem that's a result of bad, poor nutrition. And then the doctor, what does he do? What do they do? Are they relatively worthless or they are somewhat little bit helpful or are they cumulatively harmful? And my argument here, and I'm not, you know, 100% certain about this, but I think the medical profession is cumulatively worse than worthless. I think they're overall harmful. And I'll tell you why I say they're harmful. Because most of the things doctors treat are dietary induced illnesses. Certainly di you know, doctors are yes. valuable serving people in emergency rooms and surgical techniques and broken legs and you know, cut, you know, accidents. Certainly doctors save lives, even save lives in an emergency with a heart attack or something. Sure, doctors are, work great in emergencies. But 95% of medical care is not treating emergencies. It's treating people with lifestyle induced illnesses with drugs. And if we never had the drugs, and we never had the doctors treating 95% of what they do, lowering blood pressures, lowering blood sugars, lowering blood cholesterol, we never had any of that available, then just maybe people would have changed their lifestyle to lower mm -hmm. their blood pressure, lower their cholesterol, reverse their diabetes and lose the weight. And just maybe those people would have been forced and the doctors would have been forced to say what we did in the 1920s, you know, to say, you've got to start exercising twice a day. You've got to start eating salad and vegetable bean soup for dinner and three pieces of fruit and a handful of nuts. And that's it. You've got to stay under 12, 1400 calories a day. You've got to get your body fat below 15%. And we've got to get you back in good health again. But now the medical profession has become the permission prescription. The permissions, the prescription pad is the permission slip because people actually believe they don't even have high blood pressure when there are medications and the blood pressure is that's normal. True. They think my blood pressure is normal. I'm on medication. I'm okay. So now they think they can eat the same diet that caused the high blood pressure to begin with. And the inevitable consequence is the pathology continues to increase and worsen while they're on blood pressure medications. The diabetes gets worse, the high blood pressure advances, the atherosclerosis, the inflammation, the endothelial inflammation, the irritation and the loss of connective tissue in the endothelial lining of the blood vessels weaken until you burst your brain, have a brain hemorrhage. So the medical profession gives people the false permission, the false assumption that they're okay on medications and that doctors are our saviors and we can keep eating the diet that caused the problem to begin with. So Americans are eating approximately on the average about 3,200 calories a day. Most primitive societies, most long-lived societies, mm -hmm. and even in rural China today, they're eating around 1,500 calories a day. So we're eating more than double what, what people should be eating. I always say that we live on half what we eat and the other half meets the needs of our doctors. Now, <laughs> Now, even though Americans are all overweight, mm -hmm. they don't, I'm not necessarily saying they don't have the ability to just, it's not just all mental fortitude. It's that the deficiencies in the diet causes physical symptoms and instinctual behaviors and biological triggers that make you overeat food because the diet is nutritionally deficient. So now we're, look, we're talking about how did the medical profession and the food industry develop in a way that we've gotten to this place we are today where people think the answer to our problems is to take medications instead of eating vegetables you know what i mean but in any case i understand this is a difficult it is difficult for people to grasp and they don't want to change what they eat they feel that they're they can't change and they love their life eating this way and they think their life is more pleasurable if they take those risks and they don't realize they're wrong because they haven't learned enough information to realize that they're long, wrong and their body would become, their life would be more happy, more pleasurable and more satisfied even with eating if they learn to retrain their taste muscle, to retrain their taste preferences, to retain their dietary portfolio. And, you know, I've done this with hundreds of thousands of people. So I know people who have, you know, lost this weight. So I've said a lot of information. I've also said everybody in America is overweight. So I'll give you the ability to, question these exaggerations and see how accurate they are, you know, with what I'm really saying here. I mean, I think you, I mean, I think you're absolutely right on. And, and, and again, I just want to just, just thank you for all the things that you've put out over the years, because it's, it's, we need a radical change. I, the reason that I made my, my change, you know, a lot of physicians end up getting into a lot of the things you talk about, in other words, getting into preventative health and getting into 
you know, different dietary things like veganism or vegetarianism or intermittent fasting, all these things that are out here because of their own personal struggles with health. I talk to doctors all the time now. I've had them on my podcast. I've had some wonderful people. They didn't really make the change until they got sick themselves. You know, I had Dr. Robert Lufkin on the show. He wrote Lies I Taught in Medical School. He himself developed four chronic diseases and then ended up becoming this massive proponent of health and wellness similar i mean he he thinks very much like 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 you do um with just a l- little bit of differences but it's all in the same vein because we have to make radical differences you know what you said i love what you said about the fact that people just say well i like living this way i like eating this food i like doing stuff without having an understanding of what's happening you know this yolo you know, phenomenon. You only live one, you know, you only live once. YOLO, YOLO. Everyone talks about that. They're like, well, I'm not going to not have these great foods and all these other things. Again, a lot of them are synthetically made, you know, to, to make us become addicted. But the, the, the question, the next question I have is, and it's very important because it's frustrating to me because now I've become a big evangelist in trying to preach everything you just said about how radical of change we need to we need to make. Um, how has the and just in your personal opinion, and I kind of know what you're going to say, but how has the American mind become so corrupted that when you know physicians like yourself? Myself being very new to this to this game, physicians like Dr. Luff, all, all these all these incredible people out here trying to make a difference talk. It's as if they say, "Oh, you guys are just yeah, that nuts." Nah, I, I get it. That's not that important. How have we become? How has the mind been taken over? What are the interests? What are the core? Well, just just tell me what is what's your take on on how bad the brainwashing has become at this point. Well, the brainwashing has taken across, has whitewashed all of society, not just the medical profession, of course. You know, the average person still has been um, been taught certain belief systems that they're raised on, and they're very influenced by their social connection, their social network, the parents, and people come up to, to become adults with, with um, practices and beliefs that they feel are fixed, and they're not likely to, and they're difficult to change, they're rigid thinking and their fixed beliefs. So it's very hard to people to change, to radically change the way they think. That's why, you know, just listening to a, you know, a half hour, an hour podcast may not be sufficient. That's why they have to like read a collection of books, watch, they have to really study this and and see with this really, if the collective body of work makes sense. And if the evidence is sufficient to justify the conclusions that we've come to. And, you know, I've obviously, so it, it's difficult for a lot of people because they're socialized into believing all the wrong things. And they decide, you know, so I'm saying right off the bat, so they are somewhat cor- corrupt to a degree. Their minds are corrupted, but, you know, everybody's minds are, is corrupted. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, where look at all the 4,000 different religions around the world. Each one thinks they're the right one, you know, and everybody else is the wrong one. They fight each other and kill each other in the war. People, True. humans killing other humans. Everybody thinks they're right and the other humans are wrong. People scapegoat other humans. They use them as they don't. They don't feel that this other human being is emotionally equal and just as important yes. as they are, right? And they don't see that that person is that taking care of that other individual is just as important as taking care of yourself. They've they've divided human into different groups and tribes, and there's bad guys and good guys, yes. and right. So we're all evilly against each other. And we but we we brain we've been corrupted to think that way, you know. And, and so we're and so we've. But in any case, um, it it does relate to food, and here's how it relates to food, because the American diet is only two percent vegetables, by the way. It's 60% of calories from processed foods and about 34% from animal products. That's what people are generally eating. And it makes the Americans ubiquitously deficient in phytochemicals and antioxidants. Yes. And it creates a lot of inflammation in the body and the brain because they're not getting the, we're a, we're a primate and we're supposed to have a huge amount of antioxidant and phytochemical exposure. We're designed like another, like a gorilla or a chimpanzee. Now, even two servings of commercial baked goods, like croissants or bagels or cookies, or two servings of fast food a, a, a week, doubles the lifetime risk of developing depression. And people aren't eating two servings a week of commercial baked goods or cookies or 
fast food. They're eating 15, 20 servings a week. It leads to, it leads to universal dysthymia across America. It leads to reduction of intelligence and an overall lack of passion and excitement for life. And it makes people now, instead of getting their passion and excitement for doing good in the world and for how they can be useful to others, their passion and their desire for life comes from self-stimulation of the body yes. through highly addictive substances like processed foods and like you know animal fats and processed foods, including white flour, form a huge caloric rush in the bloodstream. And we'll just go back to this term and we'll write this down because we have to talk about this because I'm, I'm making this radical claim here. I'm saying that you can't achieve so many calories in the bloodstream had you lived on a desert island. You know, you lived in a, in a yes. thousand years ago, right? Humans have been on the planet for hundreds of thousands of years. And the last few thousand years, we can, we can achieve a caloric rush. But the last 30 to 50 years, we've blown it out of the ballpark how much calories we get in the bloodstream. We can use fried foods. We could use sugars. We could put white flour. We can dip the flour in oil. We can put, you know, we can, we can get so many calories in the blood at one time. And the calories in the blood at one time has an effect to affect the brain and affect, of course, making us dopamine insensitive, but stimulating the areas of the brain in the, the opiates are stimulate the same, the high, high, light up the brain, making us over time dopamine insensitive. And we could say dependent on the caloric rush to feel okay. So now if I fed you a, a bowl of vegetables, a salad with tomatoes and onions and a dressing made with oranges and cashews and sesame seeds and a bowl of vegetable bean soup and a nectarine and a couple of cherries for dessert, you wouldn't feel satisfied. Person had a salad and soup and a couple, couple of pieces of fruit, they wouldn't feel satisfied. It's not gonna enter the bloodstream fast enough. It's not gonna enter the bloodstream with enough of a rush. They need the ice cream, they need the french fries, they need the soda, they need the burger, they need the pizza. It's not enough of a stimulation for them to feel like they really got their brain, got the hit it needed. And that hit it needed has been indoctrinated into them, into their brain, into the brain chemistry. Their brain chemistry has been, they gotta have the chocolate bar, the candy, the ice cream cone. They gotta have something they don't feel satisfied from that normal size meal. And that was and the normal size meal is like 400 to 500 calories. That's not mm -hmm. enough calories for them. They got to go to 600 to nine. They got to go to 600 to 900 calories to be satisfied. And they got to have something with a higher caloric rush. They feel like they're not even eating. There's not even enough food for them. Plus the fact, so we're talking about how the brain and the body gets corrupted. The, they're, they feel, well, if I had to eat vegetables and a bowl of vegetable bean soup and some fresh figs and a mango, just shoot me right now. I'd rather be dead if I can't have my burgers and my french fries and my ice cream and my pizza. You know, just shoot me. I'd rather be dead. Their whole life becomes disproportionately focused on drug, yes. st drug stimulation. And because they're dysthymic, because the unhealthy diet and the bad nutrients make them dysth dysthymic. And for those listening, dysthymia means... Mm -hmm that you're not so depressed you can't go to get out of bed. You can still go to work, but you're not that excited about life. Life doesn't thrill. You don't wake up with a passion and joy of living every day, but your joy only comes from your ability to stimulate yourself by going to the bar, drinking alcohol, taking your snorts, going to the fast food restaurant, going out to dinner for a fancy restaurant for some um, taste stimulation. So you, you becomes, you're narcissistically consumed with yes. stimulating the self as your sole means of pleasure instead of what, how you can go out there and better humanity or enjoy the outside world. And your life has no balance. You're not enjoying the aesthetic beauty of nature and, and activity and the arts and getting to know other humans and having your opportunities when interacting with people to have creative goodwill with your most intelligent mind. Instead, your whole focus is on you don't care about much. You just care. And the more you're an addict, the more you're a drug addict or a cocaine addict or a heroin addict, the more you need those substances to stimulate the brain, the more you're just concerned with meeting your own needs for stimulating substances, the less you are compassionate and sympathetic and empathetic to the care to other people's needs. The more you just, you know, as you know, you're a heroin addict, you can lie, cheat, steal. You become more narcissistically consumed with this, your own body's needs. And food addiction is the same thing to a lesser degree, but it still has the effect to make people narrowly consume and meeting their own stim brain stimulatory needs. And their primitive brain is driving their behavior, not their cerebral brain, 
which leads to more better long-term decision-making. It's the desire for imp the impulsive desire for instant gratification that now becomes the overriding decision maker in your life. And you know what? We have tons of studies showing that nutritional deficiencies like palabra, niacin deficiency after the civil war was so rampant in the South, leading to violence, mm -hmm. anger, lynching of blacks, drugs. Half of these people were put in jail because back then in, in the 1800s, we didn't know it was a nutritional deficiency. We thought pellagra, which causes a red neck. We thought it was a genetic deficiency. I'm saying we, the medical profession, thought it was genetic that these mm. people were so, they put them in prisons. It wasn't until they started, where a doctor in 1915 figured out it was niacin deficiency, started feeding these people vegetables, were able to be let out of prison and start to behave more normally. The point I'm making right now is we're seeing the growth of the fast food and processed food and movement to the degree that and packaged food, that people are so universally deficient that it leads to their brains being more volatile, easily angered, less compassionate, and less intelligent. And there's a link between candy consumption and fast food consumption and criminality and being arrested for violent behavior or a drug-related offense. Matter of fact, one study out of England showed children who would have the highest candy consumption in the first 10 years of life, and those with the highest candy consumption had the worst diets, of course, too, were 60% likely to be arrested for a violent crime or drug-related offense by the time they were 38 years old. 60% likely, you know? And people, I, I wrote about this in my book, Fast Food Genocide, one of my yes. books. But, but the point I'm making right now is, yes, the, the brains of Americans are, have become corrupted, leading to, of course, a lot of people who don't care about protecting the world for future generations. We don't think about other people. We just think about ourselves. Yes. And we're able to damage uh, and we're able to do anything to keep, to keep in power for our impulsive behavior. And it's led to this vicious and dangerous political climate we've put ourselves into with half the country being totally, or, you know, being totally, I'm not going to say it, but they're, you know, in a dangerous cult that's can damage the world, you know? We're we're in this dangerous preface, um, we're in this dangerous point in human history, but we're also seeing degeneration of our genetic code with more autism, childhood cancers, mm -hmm. brain tumors, um, de people, depression went from one in 500 people to one in five people. We're talking about, we're, we're damaging the epigenetic code that should pa we pass on to future generations as well as our own health. So we're damaging the world and our own health and our future health of the future generations at the same time. So it is relatively scary. We do, we do need a radical shift. And what I'm saying right now can anger a lot of people too. Well, I can tell you who it's not going to anger. It's not going to anger my audience because this is exactly what they're craving. Because if they follow me, that means that they, because I, I have stepped a different path from where I was before. And and the audience that's going to look, I mean, of course, there's some people that are going to be upset by some, and they get upset by the things that I say. Like when I, you know, show a picture of a, of a pumpkin spice, you know, drink that has 900 calories. That is, is this much sugar? It's this guy. I'm, I'm disgusted by what are what we are doing to ourselves. I, I lecture my patients come to see me for their spine conditions. And they are shocked because they've ne some of them have never met me before, right? They just drove four hours from North Dakota or something. And we end up spending 30 minutes talking about how they are killing themselves. And to be honest with you, at the beginning, I was a, a little uncomfortable. I was really confronting people. I have been very pleasantly surprised at how if you show them that you care and you start giving them data, like you just dropped a lot of data and some things I, I, I'm learning, I'm just, I'm baffled by the, by the two time, you know, lifetime increase by, by just having two fast food meals a week. That's, that's insane. I've never, I've not heard that before. I, it's, I'm sure it's in your books and I missed it somewhere. The bottom line is Everything you're saying, we have to be very open and honest because the uh, I'm going to call it the other side. I don't want to say the other side, but people that in in our industry or in the in in the business of promoting things that make money as we continue to commoditize every human being, because that's all we are. We're just commodities. People just see each other as somebody to sell something to, right? 
that other side that I'm talking about, the reason we have to be very forceful is because otherwise we cannot get through. We have to speak in terms of if you do this, you're going to lose your, you know, you're not going to have legs. If you live like this, the last 30 years of your life may be staring out of the wall of some nursing home facility, immobile, sick, all these things that sh that it shouldn't be this way. And it's such a disaster. And here's my problem with the whole thing. At the beginning, when I started learning about it, I was like, oh, there's all this great stuff that we can do and we can educate patients and this and that. But the more that I talk to guys like yourself, Dr. Lufkin, some other people I've had on the show and people I talk to all the time from all across the country, I start becoming upset at how a lot of this is being you know, done on purpose. It's literally on purpose. We continue, it's it's not just like, you know, we we've been trained since we were little kids, right? We're 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 just in this world. It's 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 surreal. It's so 1984, right? It's just, it's this. It's not just that, it's that even now, where we have all these studies and statistics that clearly show the association between this disgusting, I'm gonna use the word disgusting, because there's no other, I don't have another word for it, the way we live our lifestyles and the 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 association with violence all the chronic diseases, the the self-absorption, the culture of me, 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 it's so obvious and people are actually preying on it more because like you said, the more dis dysthymic we are, the more we are vulnerable to being preyed on by that next dopamine hit that's coming. So I think it was fantastic what you said. And in fact, not only that, when it comes to our genetic makeups and epigenetics, I did an entire episode with Dr. Um, Kenneth Blum, who's one of the foremost neuropsychopharmacologists in the world. He probably should have won the Nobel Prize because he found the, the gene associated with alcohol addiction, but it all wraps up into this food addiction. And honestly, people are taking our genetic weakness which is that's one of them, and it's getting worse, right? With with the fact that we're 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 passing this on because there is this passing on of the generations. That's just the way evolution works. We talked about that, and they're just taking advantage of all of us. And again, it it took a while for me to wake up because we don't learn this in med school. No, no one speaks the way you do in med school. No one has ever said anything like this. I, we have to seek it ourselves. For so, thank you for being you know, so honest about it that the next thing is, and again, feel free. That's, that's what these, that's what these podcasts are for to really get the information out. Let me, let me ask you a question just in a nutshell, because you, I'm sure with your knowledge, you could be five hour discussion, but how has big pharma and big food through the years gotten their hands so deep into our brains where it's just been that that everyone's just given them a pass and just and just let this happen. How does it happen? And you could talk about anything from the dietary guidelines and who's behind that to who who sponsors the ADA to whatever whatever you think is relevant and you think our audience would really appreciate. And honestly, the, the sometimes people just have to become aware of it because then they become like myself where you start becoming angry at what's happened, what's been allowed to happen. And then we can do something about it when we can become advocates. Yeah. <laughs> well, all right. Well, we know that the system is kind of biased against us. It's hard to get people to eat properly and to exercise every day and to keep, and to keep to a favorable weight because biologically, when you there's we're exposed to so much waste products. Now let me define this for a second because mm -hmm. we're not we we become addicted to waste or toxins. Yes. Well, body produces waste itself. The body produces waste. The body produces are called endogenous wastes. They're things like reactive oxygen species or mm -hmm. advanced glycation end products. The body produces formaldehyde and ammonia and uric acid mm -hmm. and fusion. Mm -hmm. The body produces waste products that has to remove. And then we get exposed to waste products from the external world as well. You know, pesticides, chemicals, smoke, whatever we're exposed to, plastics. So we have this mixture of, those are called exogenous waste coming from the external environment. Mm -hmm. We have this mixture of waste. Now, the body, because we're eating food that does not contain the nutrient density that a normal person should, that normal cells should have, with a certain amount of nutrient density, including phytochemicals and antioxidants, the body has the ability to remove waste, detoxify it, protect it from damaging the cell, 
And the body is, is in, the, in the business of removing waste products to protect the DNA, but it can't because we don't have the, we're not nourished enough to yes. do so. We're not, we're not eating the right, we're not eating the right foods. And I'll, we can discuss what those right foods are later. But because, and I'm also saying here that the secret to longevity is having nutrient density in the cell. Mm -hmm. Nutrient density and nutrient diversity in the cell. And the more you, you know, bigger body mass than nutrient, but and not lack of exposure, but in any case, because the lack of nutrient intake and the exposure to noxious substances and noxious food, it increases the body that almost all Americans' body has a, a higher level of retained waste products mm -hmm. than would be possible in an, if they lived 100,000 years ago. And no, their, their body has an, unamount, an unusual amount of waste. And that waste, the, the, the waste causes disease, chronic disease, but it also causes symptoms. And the symptoms the waste causes are that if you're not, if you allow the body to try to remove waste or repair itself, you're going to feel ill, too ill to continue to live. So what I'm saying here is that we have to overeat and we have to keep the digestive tract filled in order to prevent the body from trying to remove the level of retained metabolic wastes. Because the body most effectively repairs or removes waste in the non-feeding state. When we're not eating food and not digesting food, that's called the catabolic phase of the digestive mm -hmm. cycle. You're not eating, your digestion is finished. Then the body starts to, the liver is involved with deconjugating toxins, making them fat soluble so they'd be excreted into the urine. The body's trying to repair itself and the, and the bloodstream gets a flood of, of waste products in the non-feeding state. Now, because the American diet is so deficient, the people don't feel well in the non-feeding state. They're not hungry. They just finished digesting. They don't need food. They're still overweight, but they have to eat food to stop the detoxification. They have to smoke another cigarette because when your tobacco goes down in your tissues, you start to detoxify or repair from the damaging effects of nicotine. When you're drinking 10 cups of coffee a day and, you're, and you try to stop coffee, you're going to get a vicious headache, but the headache itself is right directed. The symptoms of detoxification are painful, headaches, fatigue, agitation, irritabilityness, discomfort, stomach cramping or pain. All those symptoms people are relieved when people have another snort or have another smoke or have another food or eat, eat more, I guess. Yes. So their diet is no longer supplying them nutritionally. The diet is functioning as an addictive substance to prevent withdrawal from the bad diet they're eating. So they can't eat the normal amount of calories because the normal amount of calories won't stop the withdrawal from the top built up of toxicity. So they're half gonna have, so they think that hunger, fatigue and feeling weak and shaky, they think mm -hmm. it's hypoglycemia. Yeah, it's hypoglycemia because when your blood sugar goes down to baseline, your body's gonna effectively detoxify and try to repair. So you're gonna feel like crap because you're supposed to feel like crap in the detoxification. So I'm saying feeling bad is getting well and, and feeling better is getting sick, that the headache itself is the treatment. The headache is the treatment against the toxins. If we look up the word inflammation in Robbins and Coach mm -hmm. medical textbook, the pathology basis of disease, what we all read in medical school, the, that says the inflammatory response is closely intertwined with the process of repair Inflammation serves to remove, wall off, mm -hmm. and deal with the injurious agent, setting into motion a series of events that attempt that heals and reconstitutes damaged tissue. In other words, I'm saying inflammation is right directed. When a person gets an asthma attack, that's inflammation and mucus coming mm -hmm. out of the tissues of the lung because their body's toxic. Mm -hmm. It causes inflammation, pain, and crack of breathing, and spasm in the tissues. And doctors then give them steroids to push the inflammation back into the body, so it has to come out in the future again. And the person's on drugs for the next twenty mm -hmm. years. The person has a skin rash. With you know, they're pushing the, the rash yes. back into the body. The person's so we so people have so this has been an interaction between medical care, which is devolved to as suppressing the symptoms of disease, mm -hmm. the toxins. And the first thing you learn in medical school is that drugs are toxic. They work by blocking or interfering with some natural body processes. And people don't re recognize that mostly the most of the symptoms of disease are efforts of the body to remove a cause. 
to remove the level of toxic waste. And the doctors don't encourage the removal of waste products and the buildup of nutrients and the removal of that waste. They just suppress the, the body's ability, the inflammatory response, and the body's ability to repair itself or detoxify. I'm saying right now that the inflammatory response and detoxification are intertwined like the, like the fibers of a cloth. They work together. So we can get a person well from asthma, so they never have to have another asthma attack the rest of their life. If we fuel the body with nutrients and allow the body to finish its activities, we can let the body's headache never have a headache again. We can never, we can make it so they never, but what, what happens now is that people finish a meal and three or four hours later, they start to feel agitated, shaky or fatigued, and they think they got to keep eating again to keep their energy up. So they don't relate. And the dietary industry has fueled that to think that, you know, has tried to, we can't diet, we can't lose weight because just willy nilly and reducing calories makes us feel worse. That's like telling a person to breathe less oxygen. Unless you deal with nutritional density and unless you start to repair the nutritional deficiencies, you cannot have the person be comfortable eating the right amount of calories. So the food industry and the pharmaceutical industry has utilized these natural body mechanisms because the medical profession developed with drugs that were developed by the, from the poisonous parts of plants, because we can use poisons from herb, herbs and plants that can speed your heart up or slow your heart down or make you urinate more, or have a natural anti-inflammatory yes. effect like salicylic acid from the, we can use the, but the part of plants that has pharmacologic effects are the toxic or poisonous parts of the plants, not the nutritive parts of the plant. So we can make synthetic versions of those and we can use, but whether you're getting the drugs from the herbalist or the pharmaceutical companies, they're still not giving you nutrients. They're giving you poisons to suppress, to change the expression of symptoms. And you're, and the more, so it's, it's confused people so much because they think the symptoms are the disease and not the cause. They think yes. the symptoms themselves are the cause of the disease. The blood pressure is the cause. I just got to lower it. They don't see the blood pressure is the effect, not the cause. You don't have to lower it. You got to remove the cause so the condition continues to get worse, whether you see the blood pressure rising or not. Just because you hide it, that it's the, the in increased arterial stiffening is occurring and you're having more visceral fat building up interior and external to the blood vessel wall and you don't realize it's happening because you're on a blood pressure medication. Doesn't mean it's not continuing to get worse while you're on the medication, Well, you think you're now okay. You know, so we're, and of course, you know, we're saying blood pressure medications also lead to more irregular heartbeats and more cardiovascular yes. deaths. We're not even going there on the effects of the side effects of drugs. But, but I'm just saying, just this, the, you asked me about this interaction between the medical yes. profession, the pharmaceutical company the, and the food industry. Yeah, it's all kind of like interacted with this idea of symptoms developing from food and being toxic or weakened from the lack of a proper diet, and then the drug industry reacting with poisons that further toxify the body to suppress the symptoms and cover up the diseases that occur from those foods. And people see this as health care. And as you said before, it's disease care. Yes. And, it, and actually, it leads to furthering and accelerating the risk of death. And, you know, like, for example, the Accord study, you ever hear of that study, the Accord study? It was the action to control diabetes, you know, study by the U.S. government. It was a major finding by the NIH. And what happened was they divided diabetics into two groups. And one group got more medical care, more doctor visits, and they, their blood sugars were accurately monitored. They were medicated appropriately to keep their sugars in the most favorable range. And the other group had less medical care, less lack of attention. They were allowed to have their blood sugars run more, um, out of control. The, after a certain amount of years, I think it was about eight years, the government had to come in and stop the study because too many people were dying and having so much increased morbidity in the group getting more medical care. It was, and doctors started to talk about the Accord study. It's better to treat people's sugar so they run higher, not lower. They can confuse the whole issue. The issue wasn't, of course, it's better to have lower sugars, not higher sugars, but it's not better to lower them with drugs because it's the effect of the drugs that, because the beta cells in the, beta, in the pancreas yes. are being forced to overproduce insulin. And now they're pooping out because of demand, because insulin yes. resistance has become so high and the needs of the beta cells are so astronomically accelerating. So we're giving drugs to make the beta cells work harder to produce to lower blood sugars and they pooped out faster and the type two diabetes advanced quicker to more dangerous levels. And then, so we accelerated death from diabetes. We made diabetes progress at a faster rate with more medication. 
but it's not better. It just shows the failure of medications to treat diabetes. It did not show that they, it's not to be interpreted as better to have, you know, higher blood sugars. My, well, the way we treat diabetes and the way I, you know, here is with obviously with diet and exercise, but 80% of the people that come to me at my retreat with type two diabetes, their diabetes is gone in the first month. And sometimes their diabetes is gone in the first week. I have a guy here now. He came here on an 80 units of insulin a day, plus Genuvia and metformin. Those were the three drugs. Came in here about today. What's today? It's mid. It's the, it's the first third of the month, right? It's the first third of the month. So he comes in here. It's, it's only the first. So of course I'm concerned about hypoglycemia, eating a diet, a healthy diet. Yes. So I told him first take just take 10 units of insulin the first night instead of 80. But the next morning, his blood sugar was kind of low, like 50 or 50 or 60. It was a little too low. I didn't take the risk. So I said, let's stop the insulin right now. See how you do. The next morning, his blood sugar was like 65. You know, out of, when he comes out of control. The next day, I had it. So I, he's only been here like seven to 10 days. And I had to stop the Genuvia now, too. He's just on the metformin now. And he's going to probably stop that. It's been, it's been two weeks yet. The point I'm making is that when they eat right and they're in the process of losing weight, their, their diabetes melts away so rapidly. The diabetes himself is just indicative of the wrong diet and eating improperly and the food addiction. The minute they trained and they have the right knowledge. And so they go to doctors and doctors give them drugs, which make them gain weight and become more diabetic and accelerates their death with diabetes. You know, it's funny because I, I went to the, I was producing an NIH research grant that was submitting by the by the University of Pennsylvania, Shea Eye Institute or Will's Eye Hospital. You know, they, they had these like 10 specialists who were seeing that the, my dietary recommendations, the nutritarian diet was causing remission of diabetic retinopathy mm. and macular degeneration. And they wanted to do a study on it, right? So after having all these great researchers and, and medical doctors at Penn be in my back pocket, you know, being on, on a partnership with me doing this research and so enthusiastic for the results we're seeing, I went to speak to the, some of the head of the diabetic department, seeing if they wanted to do research department, do research on this. And by the way, I haven't done research on it. And their, their comment was, oh yeah, we know you're right. And we know if people ate right and did all the things you're saying, they would, the diabetes would go away. Yeah, but that's, but that's not the issue because the people aren't gonna listen to you. They just want a drug, they don't wanna do it. And we're not gonna waste our time in trying to prove something but people aren't gonna do it anyway. People aren't gonna follow that advice anyway. In other words, they don't understand what they were saying. Because, because they don't have the motivational skills, the background, the training to, in, to have and, and, the, and how to deal with people in group settings that come to medical practices because they don't know how to do it yes. and how to motivate and change behavior. They're not going to bother even studying it, even though they know it, could, it would work. You know what I mean? Because they're into, just like people are into the things they like to do. They're into the practicing medicine the way they want to do. They make the most money that way. They're the, they've gotten their positions. They've gotten their, you know, they just write medical prescriptions and they don't, you know, it's difficult. They're blaming, you know, people won't do it. It's the same message I had in medical school. I went to University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, right? And I, when I would speak to, you know, professors and doctors, you know, and stuff like that, they couldn't really argue with me. They would just say, you're not going to make a lot of money that way. They, you're not going to, people don't want that kind of care. They are not going to get enough. You're not going to get enough business. People want that. And maybe they were right, you know, or they said, you know, people just want a drug. They just want a drug. They want to continue their bad habits. They're not going to be wanting to change their life. It was never, a, it was never a discussion about, you know, yeah, we should be eating a salad and bowl of vegetable soup and a bowl of vegetables every night. It wasn't about, you know, yeah, we could eat healthier and not have these diseases. It was all about, you're not going to make money. You're not going to discuss the practice and people are not going to, you're not going to be able to change people's um, desire to change their diets. It was all about the negative, the negative aspect of that, right? And not about how doctors could be a unified force to teach excellent health, to role model excellent health, and we could change the whole way people see disease as something that we, you know, and use modern nutritional science and modern science to give people this unprecedented opportunity yes. in human history to win the war against heart disease and cancer, to tell people they never, everyone in America should know. Now, my mission has been, I don't care what people want to do. Let them do whatever they want. Let them smoke cigarettes and snort cocaine if they want to. But they should know about the possible effects and they should know about the dangers of that. Infant. And they should know that everybody should know that their rheumatoid arthritis and lupus they don't have to go to renal transplant with lupus and have their and take these cancer causing drugs the rest of life. They could have reversed their lupus. They didn't have to get that. Their asthma could go away. They don't have to be on inhalers the rest of their life. They don't have to have diabetes. They can get rid of it completely. They didn't have to, and they never have to have a heart attack. 
No, you don't have to have a heart attack. You can choose a dietary portfolio that will prevent a heart attack from ever happening. You don't have to be on those drugs. And by the way, heart disease is still the number one cause of death for adults in America. And 40% of heart attacks, people are dead with their first heart attack. They don't make it to the hospital alive. So their first symptom of heart disease could be a heart attack. And the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology, their brilliant response is that people who have heart disease should cut back on sodium to 1,500 milligrams a day. And I'm saying, that's like saying that people who have, who smoke, who get lung cancer should cut back on cigarette smoking. If we, if people with lung cancer should not smoke cigarettes or, right? And if people who have heart disease shouldn't be taking in salt, then the whole population should be fixed themselves. Not just people who have the disease after they created the disease after, because their first symptom could be death. In other words, we don't wait till people get sick to, re, to, to take away the causes of the disease. We should be, it should be a nationwide education at all ages. Yes. You know, suppose we have, you know, the primitive societies that are, live separate from civilization who don't salt their food. They don't see heart disease and high blood pressure in, in middle age or elderly. It's the same blood pressure as children. And, and here in, in our country, we see middle, children have higher blood pressure than toddlers. And teenagers have higher blood pressure than, chil than children. And middle-aged people have higher blood pressure than teenagers. And elderly have higher blood pressure than yep. middle-aged people. The, it's like, it's a chronic exposure damaging the, you know, we're talking about all the damaging things. I'm saying we're eating, we're putting oil in our foods. And by the way, when I talked earlier about this caloric rush, mm -hmm. I just want to make, people won't even know what I'm talking about here unless I clarify this. Because Americans get their fat intake from animal fats and oils. And us nutritarians get our fat intake from nuts and seeds and avocado, not oils and animal fats. When you get your fat from oils and animal fats, those calories at the bloodstream in three to five minutes. So if you're using olive oil on your food, you just put 200 calories into your bloodstream in five minutes. When I'm using sesame seeds, walnuts and olives, when I'm using, when I'm using food, not the oil extracted, it's going to take three hours for that oil, for that fat to come in, not three minutes. So mm -hmm. I'll be absorbing one or two calories a minute into the bloodstream. I could burn calories faster than that. The point I'm making is when the calories come in slowly, you preferentially burn it for energy. When the calories come in rapidly, the body has to store it as fat. Mm -hmm. It turns on fat storage mechanisms and mm -hmm. it raises the fat storage hormones. And of course it raises insulin. You know, the caloric, it raises insulin secretion and IGF-1, it makes more growth hormone. Yes. But in any case, I'm making this radical statement that even a little bit of oil in your diet can sabotage your efforts to lose weight because people, because oil and, and that oil is an appetite stimulant. This is so um, abhorrent and so radically to how people have been brainwashed with this idea of like the Mediterranean diet and pouring olive oil over your food and eating oil and getting your fat from, right? They're thinking that all this stuff is good. And while almost all Americans are overweight and all these people advocating the use of oil on their food are overweight people and they can't lose weight because they think they don't understand why they can't lose weight. And by the way, when I said, um, I, I wanted to give the statistics of why I'm claiming almost everybody in America is overweight and the American government and the health authorities say 77% are overweight. And I'm saying 89% are overweight because they use a BMI of 25 as the demarcation line between normal weight and overweight. And I use the demarcation line of a BMI of 23 between overweight and normal weight because all long-lived societies and, and centenarians and long-lived individuals have BMIs below 23. And the longest-lived people are males with BMIs below 22 and females with BMI below 21. So if I allow 23 to be the demarcation mm -hmm. that classifies 89% of people as being overweight. And that out of the 11% of people that are not overweight in America, the majority of those, about 8%, 8 to 9%, are cigarette smokers, alcoholics, and people with chronic diseases like depression and digestive disorders and autoimmune conditions or occult cancers. Those are mostly sick people because if they were healthy, they'd be overweight like everybody else in America if they were eating American food. It's only 2.4% of Americans that are a normal weight because they exercise, because they eat health relatively healthily enough and they exercise regularly. It's only 2.4% that have earned it without being sick. You know what I mean? Most looking at the most normal yes. weight people are sickly, you know? So in other words, 
if you're not in bad health and you eat like other Americans eat, you're going to get what other Americans get. And you're living in this danger zone where almost everybody has can't gets cancer, heart disease, strokes, and dementia. And it's going to and become overweight. It's going to happen to you. Can't escape. You can't think you're going to escape from the, these laws of cause and effect to be like other Americans are eating. Now you're. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, you you open up like I said, can of worm after after can of worm. If we just look, I mean, some of the stuff you said. I just want to break down a couple things. You, you know, you said if if. If you look at where are where we used to die before, and people have brought this up, I mean, it's just this is this is crazy stuff. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I wish I had spent my twenty year medical career thinking about these things and not just the last couple of years. But this is where I'm going to spend the rest of my career thinking about these things and talking to brilliant people like yourself about it. Right? We used to die of 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 basically infectious diseases. And modern medicine is is amazing. Some of the favorite books I've read, you know, I've read or or on kind of the pandemic of 1718, you know, of 1917, 1918, and just figuring that all out, figuring out as a virus, whatever. But all these things that we've done to control bacterial infections and, and and other things. That that's where we used to die, unsanitary, right? All the sewer systems, all these other things. In the last you know, 100 years, but really since the, you know, 70s and 80s, the explosion of every disease you mentioned is so alarming. And it's so clearly connected with the food intake that anybody that tries to dispute that now is a charlatan. They're lying and they're trying to brainwash people even further. It's it's idiotic to not understand the whole concept and you're you're really big on this the whole food as medicine and and it is big you know amongst the circles of us that are that are into this stuff but people really you're putting it in a way that that is crystal clear but people really have to understand how important what you put on your fork your spoon what you drink all these other things directly are correlated with the damage that is happening, you know, across every single disease from mental health to physical health to everything else. And just basically, if just to man, I ask people all the time, it, and, and you're right, everyone, I feel like most people around me, I'm going to even talk about the doctor's lounge. I talk to doctors all the time. They all feel they don't feel well. Why? Because they're not taking any of these recommendations. M my colleagues, their lifestyles are horrific, horrific. How are they going to treat other human beings? They don't even understand what the cause and effect is. How are then are you going to manage other people's health and wellness? So I'm also a huge proponent of teaching our colleagues how to live better lifestyles, feel better, have less burnout, those things. That's one point I, I wanted to make. I have all, all these all these kind of notes that you know that I wrote. Down. I want to talk about what you said about the diabetic patients and and building insulin resistant and this and that. I'm a spine surgeon, okay? I just want everyone to listen to this very carefully who's then become very avid about wellness. So I talk half of my clinics now, even though they're coming for surgery, I mean, I know exactly if they really need surgery, we discuss it, but it doesn't have to be a very long discussion because I've been doing this for a long time. I know what, what they need. And I say, well, we try not to operate on you, but you know, you can't walk and you have this huge disc herniation, whatever. But most of, you know, half of my visits now are all about looking at their medications, what they're doing. I can tell you as somebody, I didn't train in internal medicine or family medicine or any of these or cardiology or any of these other things. It is so obvious to me that all of my patients that I've known now, some of them for 19 years, I've been in practice for 19 years, they they went from being non-diabetic to brittle diabetics. They are an absolute disastrous mess. And you're absolutely right. And the medical, the way we treat them has contributed just this last week before we're filming this podcast. I saw this really nice lady. I'd operated on her 10 years ago. She did great. She had a fall or something, whatever. She needs more stuff done. She comes back in. I hadn't seen her for a long time. She's morbidly obese. The last time I saw her, she was non-diabetic a couple years ago. So I, I started asking her about her diabetic story. She came in, she was, she was kind of borderline diabetic. They put her on medications right away and she got sicker and sicker. She got, she got, you know, basically more and more obese. And now she has, she is on boatloads, boatloads of insulin. You know, her A1C is not controlled. I think her A1C was something like 11 
okay, on on our on our you know on our visit because I said, well, I can't even even consider doing surgery on you right now. It drove me nuts. Like it literally got me behind to my next patient. So I went on this massive tirade about it, and I said, you know what? We need you need a radical change. You, I'm sending you to a different physician. I, I I can't even watch this now. I'm not going to do. I, I'm a, and and I want to ask you about intermittent fasting because I'm a big intermittent fasting proponent. You may or may I mean you're, you're a little different the stuff you do. But I just said to her because of the amount of insulin you're on, I'm not comfortable recommending anything because if you get hypoglycemic, I can't watch. I'm a, I'm a spine I'm a spine surgeon. This is my practice. But go see this person who's going to take really good care of you. I see these stories constantly. It's the same story with hypertension. It's the same story with, you know, obesity. It's the same story with their cardiovascular disease. The more they are medicated, the sicker they're getting. Again, on this show, I want to say I'm not, we're not giving medical advice here because they need to go to whoever they need to go to to get that. That's not about that. But I will tell you, it is so obvious. It's one. It is the most crystal clear thing I've ever seen, and I know you're 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 dying to jump in here, but I am sick of seeing this stuff, and it is so under my skin. You can see I, I'm clearly not happy about it because it's 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 ridiculous. Where are organizations? Where are the organizations? Where is the ADA? Where where are all these org? Where what are they doing? I'll let you get in. I see you're rearing to go. Nah, nah, I don't. I don't have to talk. It's just okay. They, you know, it's funny because I was. It reminds me. We know insulin is a primary fat storage hormone. The minute they're on insulin, they're gaining weight. They become more diabetic. Then that's the end of their <laughs> life. It's the minute you start to take an insulin from a doctor, you, you're 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 on the road to 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 hell. But in any case, your your life is going down the tubes. But it reminds me back about 25 years ago. This person who was a um, a school principal. She gets rid of her diabetes and she writes an article about how she changed her diet and got rid of her diabetes. And the AD, the American Diabetic Association picks up the article and they contact me to write an, an article about my experience with patients to be printed in the National Anti ADA Diabetic magazine, magazine. So they send me a check for $750 to write the article. So I write an article and I put in four cases of people that reversed their diabetes and became non diabetic. And they contacted me and said they can't print the article because they didn't realize that I was going to have people be non-diabetic. They thought they were just improving diabetic control with diet. And they, because their sponsors, Eli Lilly and the drug industry sponsors their magazine, they, can't, they want me to rewrite the article and make it so that people just improve their conditions and improve their diabetes, but not became non-diabetic. So I couldn't do that. And I just said, okay, I'll rip up the check and I won't print my article. You know, no thank, no, no problem. No. Holy, that's unbelievable. It's interesting because I had Dr. Bloom on, same thing. He, yeah. all these things that he wanted to publish in these, that just rejected, I mean, just just sent back. And that was more on addiction. And yeah. there are just so many forces behind the scenes. And people have to understand there, there's a lot of different, you know, factors at play, you know, behind the scenes. Now, just taking a different, I just want to get back to the reversing diabetes because I want to get into kind of your methodology on reversing all of these diseases. Because again, as you know, there's proponents and 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 you're on the other side of the coin. There's proponents of the ketogenic diet. There's there's the in, intermittent fasting crowd. There's the paleo diet. There's the Mediterranean you know, Mediterranean diet. And then there's veganism, vegetarian, that kind of stuff. And 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 my take on the whole thing. And, as and an keep advocate, in mind, please include my nutritarian diet. Yes, yes, yes. The new and I was going to get there. That is that. That's it. Yeah, the nutritarian diet. But 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 generally, what I want to say on that is my take as a physician that's just trying to help people is I think that although, you know, I have my own kind of personal biases, I like intermittent fasting for, for patients, no matter what they do in the thing, obviously minus all the toxic foods. I like whole, you know, whole food based diets in the non fasting window. But my, my take on all of these different diets is that at least People that are going down the route of doing that and trying to get out of the classic American diet, at least they're going down the right direction. So the most hardcore, you know, vegans that I know, the most hardcore, you know, Atkins folks or whatever, they all agree. They're like, yes, this other guy, I don't agree with anything he says on that. However, I do agree that when you get into that mindset of you have to make radical shit, and some people try different things, right? And eventually they find something that 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 really helps them. 
you know, and I and I and I think that's wonderful. So my as a physician, I really do think that if it's based on evidence and science that a lot of these diets can be can be quite helpful. I'm a very big fan of the things that you I know, but I don't agree with what you're saying right now. You don't. Okay. And I love it. And that, and that, and that's what I, and, and, and I like, yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you, I'll let you, I'll let you speak on that. It's like bad information kills people and takes away their opportunity to live a healthy life tool. I think the average lifespan of humans should be 95 to 105 years old. Okay. And that's not, even, that's not stretching it because most of my patients who have been elderly when they came to me and changed their diet and they had advanced diseases, they've still pushed the other live, lived in that, you know, wow. live long, much longer in the 30, in my 30, over more than 35 years of practice. If you ask me the most significant and important findings in the scientific literature in the last decade, I'd say that there are now the culmination of scores of studies, and we can, we can show the references. I can give you the references to post. Fantastic. Yes. Studies that are done on looking at people in various dietary portfolios, different diets they, different they eat. And what we found was that as the animal protein increases in the diet at a dose-dependent rate, rate, so does premature death. So it's an inverse relationship between animal protein and premature death. And the most premature deaths, and they define premature deaths, and I'm saying this is not one study following 100,000 people for 30 years. This is 10 different studies from different researchers around the world looking at large numbers of people and all finding the same information. The amount of corroborative evidence is striking. And the people with the highest amount of premature death defined as a de death before the age of 70 were people on keto diets. So mm. the keto carnivore crowd, you know, you can smoke cigarettes to lose weight. They were looking at soft endpoints. They're not, it's, you know, medications are a dangerous way to lower your blood pressure. You know, drugs may be dangerous to lose weight, but, but using those diet styles that may give some improvement in soft endpoints are particularly dangerous. And they're documented to be dangerous than in a non-controversial way, because it's not, you can't criticize one study. You have to look at every study looking at this issue. All the studies show the same thing as prima, that the high amount of acidity, the high degree of uric acid, the high degree of, of um, chronic acidosis, the high degree of acceleration of IGF-1. There's factors that we know, mm -hmm. lack of phytochemicals that cause aging. And this is the kicker, which fascinates the nutritional science industry. Because most of the vegans and plant eaters said, we don't have to worry about protein. Because protein is, you know, it, it, there's plenty of pro protein is dangerous. What, the, what it showed was more plant protein in the diet led for longer lifespan as more animal protein diet made for shorter lifespan. And more, you know what more plant protein in the diet means? It means vegetables, beans, and nuts mm -hmm. and seeds, the high protein plant foods. Fruit's not high in protein. Rice, white rice. It's not just eating white potato. In other words, it's not, it's, it's in other words, there are styles of plant foods that are not necessarily lifespan promoting. And if you're gonna live on white flour and sugar and eat, you know, and that's why most studies where they showed like, oh, well, you cut red meat down and people didn't live that much longer because they either switched to chicken or they switched to pasta. They weren't eating beans and nuts and vegetables. Mm -hmm. It's that beans and nuts and vegetables were so protective that they enhanced lifespan in a life, in a dose dependent manner. And the longest lived populations their probability of living to the longest li li lived life, the longest lived people, was proportional to the amount of vegetables they ate, and the food that promoted long, long life the most was green vegetables, of course, mm -hmm. with no threshold effect. By the way, no threshold means that you know mushrooms make you live longer, but there's a threshold. After you eat a certain amount of mushrooms, yeah. eating a half a cup, eating two cups, is not going to make you live longer than eating a half a cup. You're eating half a cup. Tomato sauce is really good for you, but once you have your you know third of a cup, two cups of tomato sauce is not going to be better for you. You know, you know. Onions are really good for you, but once you have half a cup of onions, you've maxed out on the saline. But with green vegetables, as people went from one cup to two cups to three cups to four cups a day, as the volume went up, so did lifespan enhance in a dose-dependent manner. So not only does, but in any case, we have so much, and I've, and I've reviewed, you know I've reviewed more than 30,000 yes. studies yes. on this subject. I might reference 20,000, I might reference 2,000 studies in my book, Eat for Life, for example, yes. but I've reviewed 20,000 to pick out the best 2,000. You know, so in other words, um, we're talking about, it's not that the science is so controversial and there's so much data to suggest there's a lot of good ways to eat and a lot of these things are kind of, and who knows to what to believe. That's not what you see when you go through the science. If you sit down diligently and look at all the data, it pretty much all agrees. It pretty much, every study that looks at the data 
shows that more vegetables and beans and onions and mushrooms and nuts in the diet make people live longer. And, and taking those foods out of the diet makes people live shorter yep. lifespans. And, and the, 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 the scientific evidence is overwhelmingly corroborative and strikingly consistent, not inconsistent. The, the powers that be and the people trying to sell you some ideas and some internet sciences, they can you know, use a short-term study, use, you know, pick some data out. Yes. But if you look at all the data, it, you, know, you can show eggs. You can show eggs don't hurt people because they give them person, once a person's consuming over 300 milligrams of cholesterol a day, giving them an extra egg is not gonna make it even worse. Once you're smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, having a third pack is not gonna make you that much worse. But but you know it's like the same. If we if we pick out the right, we could design the study to show anything. But if we look at all the thirty or forty thousand studies we have on the subject, we know where they point. So let me let me ask you a question. This is this is great. This is this is fantastic because as we kind of go through it, because people do get a lot of different information. The problem is most of our colleagues, especially the ones that are not as dialed into these things, they don't have they, they have very like almost no information. They just say anything and they they don't they don't really right. help people with their diets at all, honestly, because I asked my patients this question, and I know that you know this. I say, well, what has your primary doctor, what diet did they put you on? And they just look at me, they're like, Well, what do you mean? Like it, 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 diet and nutrition's not even it's not even talked about in the in the seven nine 12 minute visit but let, let's go back i want to go back to because i know that that how i and i think and you know i i, I love i don't want to go through all those you know the different you know your nutritarian diet's very important i think it's great i mean I, I i really do i think you know i'll be after this podcast by the way i'll be just having a nice dose of beans and vegetables and everything like that and hopefully add to it i do that anyway but Let's go back to when, what I said before about I, I as, as a physician, if people are trying, you know, to to make the right steps and things like that. So let's talk about intermittent fasting, not really necessarily keto, non-keto, those things, because, it, it, you know, you made that that position clear. If you look at Dr. Jason Fung's work, for example, he wrote the obesity code and you look at um, how restricting eating no matter what you're eating in that time period, obviously he he recommends fresh whole foods, red vegetables, all the stuff you talk about, but some meats, whatever. Just restricting to a to a eight hour window or less, depending female male. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff with intermittent fasting reverses the majority of diabetes. Now, even if they're not choosing to do kind of like the nutritarian lifestyle or doing that, would you at least on that front just intermittent fasting with a variety of different foods? Would you agree that just that though, because it's easier in a way? I mean, it definitely is easier. So it's been very very easy for me to put my patients on intermittent fasting. We've had people lose 150 pounds on it and, and reverse their diabetes. But would you at least say that intermittent fasting is the right step into reducing calories and to healing some of these chronic diseases out here? Because you know the intermittent fasting crowd is, is, is as adamant as you are about what intermittent fasting can do to improve people's health, at least in the, in the, in the short to medium term, maybe not lifespan. Well, it could be a useful tool, but let me have, give some caveats here, okay? Sure. We heal and repair during sleep and the healing and lose weight during sleep. That ability to heal and repair and, and, um, and, and the anti-aging phenomena is enhanced when you're not digesting food, when you're sleeping. If you eat late at night and you go to bed in a full stomach, then you're de decreasing the ability of sleep at night to do, to do its magic. So intermittent fasting has shown to be an advantage when people stack their calories earlier in the day mm -hmm. and eat lighter or earlier dinner to allow their digestion to finish for the day so they can go to bed on an empty stomach and get the full benefit from their sleep hours in bed. So they're not digesting food simultaneously when they sleep. So that type of intermittent fasting has proven benefits. But when people start to use intermittent fasting by eating a late dinner and skipping breakfast, and make their caloric window be from 12 noon to eight o'clock at night, there's no lifespan benefits. Lifespan benefits are only when you're, in, when you're intermittent, your time-restricted eating is shifted to the early part of the day, not the late part of the day. The point is, is don't eat a big meal at bedtime. That's the most important thing to remember. Yeah, the second, all, yeah, okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
The second thing is, is that I deal in my practice over the last 30 years with 20,000 people. And my, the people that come to me mostly are overweight people with food addiction. And they've had problems sticking with the diet and losing weight. And the worst thing that they could do is yo-yo their weight and lose weight and then binge and gain it back again. Weight loss is of no benefit unless you keep it off. And the success you get with a program is of no benefit unless a person can maintain it long-term. And here's the problem sometimes with when you restrict calories too far down and you go to 500 calorie days or intermittent fasting for a month and they rotate 1200 calorie days with 800 and 500 calorie days, is when you follow these people who got, who got benefit from it, by the way, so many of them, it pushed their brain to the point of deprivation. Mm -hmm. And then they're too likely to binge and go to Vegas and eat overeat and put weight back on. And then they've defeated the benefit of their diet. We have to be very careful because my experience as, because I use, have used juicing and water fasting and intermittent fasting. I wrote a book on it, by the way, that was published in 1996. I was the first person who wrote a book on fasting. You know, just, you know. <laughs> but anyway, so, but the point I'm making is in, in these patients that I have see over time, I find that their chance of long-term success to reduce the chance of recidivism has to get better results when we define and identify their caloric window. Let's say the caloric window is 1,200 to 1,400 calories a day. This is your window. You're a five foot one person who your body mass, your, your musculoskeletal mass on the in-body test, you're only, you only have 95 pounds of, 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 of non-fat mass on your body. And your, and your basal metabolic requirements are 1,200. If we add 200, so you should be consuming 400 calories a day. When we try to speed it up too rapidly, the results by with sometimes aggressive intermittent fasting or mm. fasting or juice fasting or even dieting too too fast, you have a higher likelihood of them not sticking with it long term, because they start to obsess about food so much that eventually it's like telling them they they go back the other way. I find more success was showing them how good this can taste. Have we defined their caloric window? We've given them a breakfast, lunch, and dinner they can eat, and they're dropping two to three pounds a week. Don't forget my average person who comes to my retreat even is losing 20 pounds the first month if they're a male and 15 pounds the first month on the average if they're a female. Subsequent months are five pounds less, like 15 pounds for the male, 10 pounds for the female. They're losing weight relatively rapidly. So that the point is that in six months, in five months, they've lost 60 pounds, right? If I want to go faster than that, it might backfire on me because they'll either stop losing or they'll rebound or they won't stay with the diet long enough. So I got to retrain their taste muscle, retrain their emotional wisdom, retrain their understanding of food addiction and medicine, retrain their knowledge about nutrition and get them practice the right technique and find some of the foods they like and the recipes they desire to make them stay with this long-term, like teaching Roger Federer's perfect tennis stroke to practice it the right way over and over again, a thousand mm. times, so it becomes second nature. My concern is that, sure, intermittent fasting can be helpful for some people, but we have to be careful because if we start to go too far down and give them those short days, watch for this because you're taking away from some time that could have been devoted towards people getting the cook because they got so much to learn. The cooking classes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the retraining of the taste buds, the nutritional science, the emotional wisdom, the, re the how to deal with addictive be thoughts and pro the, the neg negativity bias when you're coming off addictive substances. And there's so much. And, and getting them, I, I usually prefer to get them on a diet that's consistent day after day that they're going to stick with long term, that they're going to make some changes. The soups will be different. You know, the salad dressings will be different, but it's still a salad, it's vegetable, bean soup and bowl and for, for, for dessert for lunch. I'm just varying the salad dressings and varying the soup. But but in any case, and then I'm using a form of intermittent fasting. The form of intermittent fasting I'm using is where they finish eating for the day at, let's say, 5 o'clock or for the latest 5.30 for the day. And so they go to bed at 10 o'clock. They haven't eaten. They, so they learn to, that they might have a little dessert at night. And that marks to mark the – because they ate the dessert before they got full, before they overate. Well, you, well, you have that vegetables on your beans on your plate. And then you have the bean burger and the green vegetable wok and the Thai curry sauce on there. Then have your little bit of banana ice cream with, with frozen banana with, you know, real vanilla bean powder and the macadamia. Have a little bit of that because then you shut down the kitchen. You shut off the restaurant, mm. you know, clean your teeth. You got away from food. So it's like intermittent fasting. And then you learn how to recreate without food, without putting mm -hmm. something in your mouth. 
right? You're doing you're doing jokes and singing and entertainment and watching and card, you know, and games, and you're doing and you're enjoying the unit of the world around you and you're enjoying your conversation socially with other people. You're not recreating with food. You learn food not to be your recreation because your your evenings are recreation, but you got to learn how to recreate and have fun in your life. It's not loving around food. So yes, I'm an advocate of intermittent fasting, but I'm just defining the caveat here that I don't. I still want people to generally eat, eat breakfast. And I want them to eat less as the day progresses mm. and they want them to not eat before break dinner time. But I don't want them to do those 500 calorie days and try to mm -hmm. overly restrict calories because that, that even though it works for some people, and I'm sure there's plenty of people it's good for, in too many cases, you have more, more chance of recidivism and regaining weight and not, people can't stick with it long term. Yeah, I mean, I think those are all great points. I, I can just tell you like... Um... For myself, I, I do a window. I don't really restrict necessarily my calories, but I spend a lot of time in in the gym working out. My concern sometimes, person, this is personal stuff, but like somebody like myself that I, you know, I like to, you know, do really heavy weights. I'm just, I, I don't want to get into catabolic states by not having enough nutritional intake during my my own personal fasting window. But that that that's just me, and we can get into, you know, how. With with your diet, you can take in enough protein to maintain muscle mass, especially if you're trying to keep on muscle mass for whatever you know whatever particular reason. But I like what you said too about the thing. I've seen that a lot, and I've seen it in women more. And I'm not exactly sure what the science behind it is, but I've seen women that have tried the breakfast skipping version of the intermittent fasting that have come back and said that they've actually gained weight instead of lost weight on it. And I love that. I think. It's it's way better. You're absolutely right because of all the healing that happens during sleep to restrict the calories more and more as the day goes on. I think that that would be more beneficial, you know, to them. So I, I think I need to look into more of, of, of those things as, as we try to figure out, you know, just what the right thing is. And, and, and I think it is, you're absolutely right. It's absolutely different for different people, different body types. It depends on what their nutritional needs are. It also depends on what their calorie expenditures are, right? Somebody like myself that spends, you know, an hour and a half working out every single day is very different than somebody that's more sedentary, that's not going to use it, I think, as far as w w the way you do your nutrition timing and and if you're going to have carbs, when to have, I mean, it, it's just, there, there's a lot of complexities way behind. I mean, we need a 10 hour, we'd have to do a, a webinar on it to, to, to get all this information out, but just, just, you know, some thoughts on it before we get into the, into exactly what is the nutritarian diet and, you know, what do people really need to know about and what would a typical day look like on the nutritarian diet? But if anyway, if you want to comment on the stuff I said, but then get I'll, into the I'll nutritarian comment just yeah. on what you said, because yeah. even though we understand that being strong and fit is important for lifespan, definitely. But you have to keep the NOSH study in mind, which shows that the shortest lifespan of, of um, any occupation in North America are linebackers on football teams because they had to eat extra that degree of food to weigh over 250 mm -hmm. pounds, whether it's muscle or whether it's fat, that being excessively large and eating to be excessively large is still life man shortening. Yes. So bodybuilders get overwhelmingly consumed with getting extra big and eating to get that big. And they have to eat extra food and extra yes. protein to get that big unnaturally large. And it's not good for their health when, you know, we want to be fit and lean and no. look at the, you know, and yeah. look at the, like when I'm looking at, keep in mind, um, I've advised world-class and Olympic athletes. And I was, you know, obviously I was a professional athlete yes. for many years. But, um, and I still actually do a lot of very aggressive athletics. You know, I do, um, you know, you know, mogul skiing all day long, you know, and, the, you know, I love to stay fit and be very physically fit and be very active. But in any case, we're trying to extend the lifespan of athletes, the performance span and play span of athletes. That's where the goal is to like, LeBron James playing basketball in his 40s. Yes. You know, Tom Brady playing football and his, until he's 40 years old. We're talking about living, being, having a high play span. And my, one of the athletes I advised, Eric Schlappi, was in four Olympic games in downhill skiing. You know, and why did he follow this pro? And these, these tennis players like Novik Djokovic, why mm -hmm. do they eat this way? They follow, and why do they, um, what's their, um, anyway, so the point I'm making is that all these athletes who are back in, in, in yes. prolonging their career, they, it's not excessive largeness. Novich Djokovic improved his stamina to be able to last into the fifth set better. He didn't get bigger. He got better, 
better cardiorespiratory condition by taking yes. better care. So he watches his diet and all these guys watch their diet really carefully for longevity, anti-aging and cardiovascular health. And that's, you know, so I can ski at high altitude and breathe and fly, fly down the mountain and bounce on the moguls. I'm not looking to get excessively large. Of course, I'm still, I have still the six pack. <laughs> there we seven, go. <laughs> I still have a six pack at 70 years old. My body fat's still, you know, below 10%, but I want people to just, you know, cause we can design a diet to maximize growth in the gym, but that's not our goal. It's the, it's the, and it may be somewhat contraindicated because you're designing to maximize growth in the gym. It's not going to be the same diet that you're using to maximize lifespan and health span. No, I think that's real important. And what I will say is that for myself personally, I'm 50 now mm -hmm. and I, you know, I still get to the gym a lot. I really, I mean, it is really my you know, kind of my sanctuary, you know, where, I, where, where, you know, I've been doing it for a long time, but I used to have a resting weight of about 225. Obviously I didn't know what my BMI was. It wasn't great, but now I'm around 190 pounds and a lot leaner. And I, you know, I'm very serious about my diet and I feel infinitely better. My joints are because I was having joint pain. I was having ankle pain, I, all yeah. kinds of pain. It's so much better what I, and, and, and it's so important. And I will tell you that self-experimenting, especially, you know, like I'm sure you've done a lot of self-experimenting and changing little, little, little things about diet and feeding windows and stuff. And I do a lot of it too. But what I will say is where I'll, well, where I definitely agree with you, um, even though I do consume some animal fats, it's a lot less than it was before. I do intermittent fasting, but the interesting thing is that absolutely the more phytonutrients I put into my body, the more I'm, I'm all these green leafy vegetables and beans and all this other stuff, it is a hundred percent correlates with the amount of kind of overall body soreness that I feel just in being 50 years old, but also continuing to do the athletic endeavors that I'm, that I'm trying to do now and trying to play basketball with my kids, all kinds of stuff. And so I, I think it's fascinating what you say, and you're absolutely right. All these guys, when they're in the in the kind of tail end of their careers, they do look at getting on diets like the, like your diet because it's so anti-inflammatory and and it's so good not just for lifespan, but it's good for health span, current health span. Can you yeah. talk about? Um, well, the name, the, yeah, the name where it was on my tongue was Venus uh, Williams too. Remember? Oh yes, yes. Because she absolutely. left the tennis tour. Yes, yes. With Sjogren's with an autoimmune disease and recovered using eating a healthy diet. Right, got back to tennis again. So we're talking about the ability of yeah. the, you know, and and that's the press. Why are the press focused on that? That these people, but anyway. Because they like and, to focus so, on things like the newest Alzheimer's, you know, drug or something like that, which is a whole other so, podcast. That so how's, your, how's your body fat now that you're 190? What's your body fat percent? You know, you I know? haven't. I have to do. I have to get it done. I mean, I'm actually going to get it done here in the next couple of weeks. I'll, I'll report. I'll report back to the public. I'll do. I'll do a. a no, do don't a report back. To report back to me. Just report back. I will. Back to me. I, I will. Well, I like to, like to treat your body. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like to. I like to keep by. Uh, you know, now that I'm, you know, doing all the social media stuff, I like to keep people kind of involved in my life. So anytime there's a milestone, I just let them know what's going on. But. Uh, but I feel, you know, I feel a lot better and, and it's made a huge difference. Obviously, even though I'm a spine surgeon, my, my, I was trained as an orthopedic surgeon and it's, 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 it's crazy. So if you, if you, even if you just look at just, just weight, just body weight, just look at body weight for every pound of body weight you take off, you take four pounds of pressure off of what you're feeling in your knees. That's dramatic when it comes to preserving your cartilage and not having to have knee replacements and things like that. So I'm not trying to put my colleagues out of business, but certainly if we had leaner, healthier people, they're going to do it. Not to mention when you go on these type of anti-inflammatory diets, it's pretty dramatic what it can do for pain. I can tell you when my patients as spine, you know, they just have bad discs or something. I'm not going to do surgery on them. I put when they go on anti-inflammatory diets, it's dramatic for pain, dramatic but people and, don't understand that because it's hard. They rather have a prescription for a narcotic or an anti-inflammatory than actually do some of the work. I know you're a proponent on, you know what, they've got to do the work. It's not easy. You got to just do the work if you want to be healthy. But anyway, you know, yeah, what's you it? Have, you? The body <laughs> fat is a source of inflammation. Yes. The body what? fat produces cytokines, lipokines, throws out reactive oxygen species, it accelerates, it raises estrogen. It causes insulin resistance. The body fat. There's no such thing as a healthy, overweight person. And you, you, and if, a, and if a woman's body fat's above 25, percent 
the inflammatory molecules start to leave the tissues. And if a male's body fat's above 15%, you know, yes. so, you know, we got to get, and, and I'm not even saying 25 and 15% are ideal. I'm just saying they're the point where you don't see a huge amount of inflammation coming out. And almost everybody has body fat above those points. But in any case, um, people try to, they want to give themselves permission to be overweight and think that you can be overweight and healthy simultaneously. When you can't, it's impossible. There's no such thing as a healthy, overweight person. Fat is still making insulin resist, making you insulin resistant, and the extra insulin production is accelerating, your, is shortening your lifespan. You know, but in any case, um, the, well, yes. the, I, could say the all, I mean, the time that this idea, and it's funny because it's already faded. Okay, it's already faded, but the time that this idea of how unhealthy it is to be overweight, and again, it's not this isn't fat shaming, this isn't any of that stuff. People that know me, they know that, you know, I I kind of I, you know, I'm just a super positive. I love everybody. I'm just trying to help people, but there is no healthy overweight person because and you know when it came out, COVID. And that's when people were talking about it. Do you you know what one of my pet peeves was? And it is now we're digressing, but this is important stuff. This is the stuff that really bothered me. And I think COVID opened up my mind. And so when this stuff about really becoming a wellness advocate fell into my lap, I ran with it because in COVID, I was really bothered by the way people were processing the information. How many times did we say, how many articles were there. We could pull them up now. I mean, we could go on Google right now. How many articles were there? Oh, another young, healthy child dies of of COVID. And then they would pull up the picture. And, and they these are ginormous, obese children who were becoming sick. And they were just calling them, the press, the media was calling them normal. They were saying, oh, this normal, healthy child. There is, ain't nothing healthy about that picture that I'm seeing. I'm just being honest. I'm not I'm not picking on anybody. Would I hug that child if they were here? Absolutely. There's, am I going to call them healthy? No. But in COVID, it was so clear that morbidly obese patients, because of the release of cytokines and interleukin-6 and blah, 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 it was just going crazy. They were having these secondary explosions, right, of inflammation in their body, and then they and then they and then they were dying. And there, it was really portrayed in the media because after the media stopped hiding it, then they had to say, "Well, ooh, if you're obese, you're really at risk for this disease. It's a big problem." But all of a sudden now, it's fine, right? You see all the billboards around. It's healthy. It's all healthy. It's all good. And again, I'm not a whatever, but we have to be honest. If we're not honest, we can't help people to to better themselves. Yeah, the, 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 that's right. There's a big movement, you know, healthy at any weight and like yeah. fat shaming and all this stuff. And obviously, I'm a health nut. And, you know, I don't want to lie to people, you know, and we got to go with the science and because then you're selling that person out because the person, because there's so many people who are on the fence who would be want to make the necessary changes to get well if they knew what those changes were and had the scientific support for them and telling it's okay to be 10, even 10 pounds overweight. It's not okay to be 10 pounds overweight. That raises you 10 pounds of extra body weight dramatically increases your risk of cardiovascular death and infectious rate of death, by the way, pneumonia. Yes. You know, it reduces it. So we're talking about striving for nutritional excellence is a great hobby that gives people more personal satisfaction and it gives them the ability to live without fear and living without the fear of, you know, living with the pride and optimism that you are going to live a long time and enjoy your life with your full mental and physical faculties is very rewarding for people. And, and I, I think that People don't have any idea how powerful food is, let's say, to protect you against cancer. They think cancer is genetic or that it's just that we don't even know what caused my cancer. You know what I mean? It was in my genes and my mother got a, gave me a gene. It's like we're been brainwashed with all the wrong information because, you know, the data out there shows that's not true. If you eat healthy, you have gene silencing, that the, your genes are the product yes. of what you eat. And cancer is a product of what you eat, what you ate, and what you ate as a child, and all you know your whole lifetime exposure to food. And you, we don't have to have cancer, and we have the nutritional knowledge to wipe cancer out. And we could spend billions of dollars on cancer research, which goes towards drugs to treat cancer, is not the same thing as, as educating the population why they don't have to get cancer. So we, in other words, we have this information, and it's been a, been a a struggle to get it out to them to Americans. And listen, not just listen, it's not just cancer, it's everything we talked about before, not to mention and again, you know, we we you know our our our, our time I've got a, a couple more you know, a couple more questions for you here. It, you know, not to mention dementia 
type three diabetes. Now people are starting to throw around the words type three diabetes. I'm curious on, on the dementia front, you know, Dean Ornish, I don't know if you know him, you know, the doc, but he, he recently came out with that landmark study on, um, on Alzheimer's disease and showed significant improvement in cognition on doing a strict vegan diet on them and people have you know and there is a lot you know going back to some of these other diets just going more to the like the ketogenic diets and mental health and i know how you feel about that for you know for obviously for lifespan but but the point is is that changing food can make a dramatic difference in a lot of these chronic diseases and and on i mean man when we talk about the topic of our mental health crisis our dementia crisis you know there's a hundred thousand people in just minnesota that you know that that have that are, are under the alzheimer's kind of un umbrella i mean we have so much dementia going on but people are not connecting it with diet and they need I, I, listen researchers are the outspoken doctors like yourself clearly are Dean Ornish, all these guys, they're very much about it, but it's not connecting in the brains of people that are YOLO and I'm going to live my best life. And I'm going to go to all these fancy restaurants and just throw down all this nonsense of food. It's just, just junk food. And it, it, it's just such, it's so obvious. And the science has, is becoming clear. There was a great diagram uh, recently that I saw that showed the explosion of articles being written on food as nutrition for dementia. It's, it, it's, it's crazy. It was a little tiny blip, you know, just 20 years ago, and it is exploding because researchers such as yourself are all over this, the clear association between all of these lifestyle diseases. And that's what they are. They're lifestyle diseases. And develop you know and developing the, the these things what's what is your thoughts on 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 the diet you know that you are behind and dementia and preventing the development of dementia or even helping dementia and people that have early cognitive decline well you know that's what's so encouraging here is that what i'm saying is the dietary portfolio of foods that maximally slows aging and extends human lifespan is therapeutically effective to reverse disease like high blood pressure, diabetes, arthritis, asthma, headaches, fatigue. It maximizes human healing to re make people recover from psoriasis and lupus. And it prevents the major causes of disability in later life, like cancer and dementia and heart, and heart disease too. So yes, I'm saying, believe it or not, that these things that afflict everybody in America are unnatural. They're not normal. They're demonstrative that the American diet is so disease causing. And it's not some crazy discovery. It's going back to that if we eat natural foods and get enough phytochemical and antioxidant exposure with the right type of nutrient density in the cell, the lack of toxic exposure. So it's nutrient density, lack of toxic exposure, and having a favorable omega-3 index, mm -hmm. then dementia does not happen. Dementia simply does not happen. Sure, you know, we know that there could be exposure to cigarette smoke or to burning fires or something. Yes. Yeah, there are unusual causes of dementia. There are unusual causes. And an unusual cause, you know, one of the causes of um, Parkinson dementia syndrome that causes ALS is the consumption of bivalves and shellfish because bivalves, because of the, not just the dumping of plastic in the water, mm -hmm. it's this much agricultural nitrogen in the water leading to algae overgrowth causing so much cyanobacteria and with being eating lake fish too from algae overgrowth and cyanobacteria dumping BMAA in lake fish and bottom feeders in the coastal waterways showing a link between the these um bivalves or clams mussels oysters mm -hmm. and scallops have high rates of BMAA which is linked to ALS and now of course Parkinson's dementia syndrome so of course there's toxins and people who work in people who go who dry clean their clothing or work in dry cleaners also that can expose themselves to Parkinsonian causing chemicals. You know what I mean? And people who work for um in who are the migrant farm workers who work with with um with food chemicals. So there's a lot of causes, but this, the point is is that we know how to eat, we know what to protect our body from, and we know how to live to live a long, healthy life with our full physical and mental faculties intact. And that's the beauty of this message. We can live without fear. We can have a better life. And nutritional science is a real blessing when we apply it 
it's the it's the greatest hobby you can possibly have. No, abs absolutely. And you know, it's one of the things we we didn't get a chance to get into in a, in in really you know nuanced fashion is is how important these types of nutritional changes can be one in preventing cancer, but then in people that have cancer using nutrition either as adjuvant care for it to reduce side effects of chemotherapy to do whatever, because I think that once you get the cancer, it's usually a combination of, of, of traditional Western medicine can help. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. And I, I'll just ask for your brief thoughts on it. Traditional Western medicine, but then also dramatic dietary changes, either to prevent recurrences and things like that. But cancer is such a scourge in our society now today. And so much of it is preventable. And it's bizarre that when a physician like myself says it, especially as a classic spine surgeon, I say stuff like this and people are like, oh my God, this guy has become like, he's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs now. He's listening. Who are you listening to? Like, oh my God, you got to get off of uh, Twitter. Your, your, your brain is being poisoned. I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Do you read? Do you read? Do you have something called the internet where there are reams of, of it's so clear the connection between food and cancer? But what are, what have you seen on the cancer front? And then once you get cancer for people that have cancer, really what they, what do they need to do? And how does the diet, you know, the, the nutritarian lifestyle then help them if they've unfortunately already developed the cancer? Well, thank you for that question. I have to plug myself there with my book, Eat for Life, yeah, because of course. I have the cases of the cancer cases, and I have the right. diet. I fed them to get that results, and I have all the – I want people to be able to like get the information. We can't do it here all day, but but yes, and I published a study in the International Journal of Disease Prevention and Reversal as well with a case series of people who had cancer. Just to give you a couple of cases, um, one lady, Pam, had – ovarian cancer that metastasized to her lung, we having four leaves of fluid extracted from a lung. lung. She was treated with chemo. And of course, her, she had a chest tube in to redrain the fluid out of her lung and given about six months to live. And she's alive 27 years later now. She's not alive because she was, that they, the chemo made her live 27 years. There's no people who had chemo for metastatic ovarian cancer stage four who are alive like that. And I've got multiple cases like that of ovarian cancers who are still alive 20 years later. You know what I mean? So, uh, so it's cases like that or people would, the same thing like people with, um, because they, they die often when the cancer comes back because when right. the cancer comes back, it was the cells that escaped chemo the first time. And when it comes back the second time, the cells are resistant to chemo because they were the ones that weren't killed back then, you know, five or 10 years later. And the body has the ability to maybe seek out and destroy the individual cells that escape the chemo, but it doesn't have the ability to maybe destroy a large tumor or, or, or cancer with so much bulk at that point when they were, you know, when the first, so yeah, I have a lot of cases like that, a lot of published cases on that. And, and when we have a lot of men with prost with early stage prostate cancer that just reverse themselves, you know, with no, I have people with lymphoma, with non-Hodgkin lymphoma that reverse themselves just with changing their diet with no chemo. So yes, I mean, absolutely. I've had a lot of experience and a lot of astonishing success that you would have never expect from a board certified family physician like myself, who's not an oncologist, which means that most of the people coming to me are diabetes, high blood pressure, yeah. rheumatoid arthritis, headaches. They're not cancer, but the cancer patients I have seen, even though it's not everybody in the practice, have made incredibly remarkable results with this protocol of the right type of diet, the portfolio of foods, with the vegetable juicing, with the three parts in it, with cruciferous juice and, and usually one third bok choy, one third carrot and beet, and one third lettuce and celery. So we have the three part juice, which they take twice a day. They eat the healthy diet. They take the supplements with the curcumin and the green tea yes. extract and the mushroom extracts and the, they, you know, and they, then it's just, it's just phenomenal results we've been seeing, you know? So yes, we're talking about preventing cancer. Yeah. But also even when people have cancer, when you don't put the right diet in there, the results you get from chemo alone or medical care alone is, is very poor hundred percent because that really i want people to really listen to mm -hmm. just using traditional you know not true i don't want to say traditional current conventional let's say conventional methods of treatments of cancer may not be enough 
and we need to explore these other things. Now, there is a lot of controversy because there's all these clinics that do all this. You know, people go to Mexico, and, and I've talked about this on my on my podcast before. So I want to be really careful. I'm not an oncologist. This is not my area of expertise. But one thing you can't criticize people for, like yourself, is putting people on these very healthy, nutritious diets that can make dramatic differences in their overall health and well-being and can keep them living a lot longer, right? You're not you're not telling people, well, if you have stage four ovarian cancer, don't get, you know, com you know, conventional treatments. You're saying, yeah, that's what, but that might be one part of it, but it's just one part of it because that's not going to, you know, keep you around for a long time necessarily. You need to do these other things and, you know, and kudos to you because honestly, a lot of traditional, you know, a lot of current medicine is not, they're not telling people that. It's just medicine after medicine, and that's it. That that there's no other, there's nothing else to fill in, and that goes for every disease that we've talked about so far today. And like I said, it really, really bothers me, and and it's just one of these things. I I can't unsee it, and now I have to talk about it and talk to people like yourself and get the word out where. You know, there, there, there are certain segments of the population, even though you, you have a long list of great books that you've written with all kinds of information, there are a, there's a big segment of the population that don't even have, an, they don't even know that these things exist because no one's pointing them in that direction because they're too busy being, they're in the matrix. They need that pill so that they wake up in their cocoon and all of a sudden they're like, oh my God, I didn't know, like sort of what happened to me. I think, you know, in it, you know, kind of the last thing I want to do because I want really people to understand what the the diet um, that you're espousing a nutritarian. So, what does it mean to be a nutritarian? Uh, just, just very succinctly, just so p the takeaway is maybe this is a lifestyle that they want to get on. And then you talk about GBO MBS foods. Can you explain that? Because I don't want people leaving here without having a great foundation of exactly kind of what the diet is, so that they can go. And then we'll we'll talk about some you know where to find you, the resources, and and all these other things, and and obviously your books, which I'm gonna avidly promote obviously on 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 my channels because i i really believe in them you've got some wonderful books you've written so can you just give us a a, a just in a nutshell what's the nutritarian diet and 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 the gbo mbs foods that that must be part of of people's daily habits thank you and ex exactly that the g-bombs yeah. is just an acronym <laughs> and all g-bombs stands for are those foods with the most scientific evidence. This is scientific studies. I'm not making claims here, just based on my own personal experience, even though it's very broad. I'm basing it on a lifetime of research. I even employ a full-time research scientist that works for me too, that we just we review the science all the time. And the G-bombs highlight those particular six foods, greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. I can even say that again but are foods that have tremendous scientific evidence to extend human lifespan and prevent cancer and are necessary for maximum function of the immune system. That mushrooms are the richest source of ergothionine, which stabilizes the cell, which has an attachment, a receptor on the cell surface that helps to stabilize the DNA. We're talking here about that the isothiocyanides in cruciferous vegetables are necessary to fully activate the antioxidant response element in the cells that helps keep the cells clean and prevents DNA damage. That the, the body is made with dependency on these nutrients that are found in these foods. And by eating these foods in our daily diet, we're able to manifest normalcy. And if you don't wanna eat green vegetables, live close to a hospital because you're not gonna be normal. <laughs> you can't have normal immune function if you're not eating green vegetables. And you have to eat raw green vegetables too. And, and the body, the, sulfur, the lettuce, and eating raw greens and like a salad is essential to the microbiome, to the biofilm, yes. the cups of the villi. And so you have to eat a salad every day. I always say my mantra is the salad is the main dish. At least once a day, I have a big chopped salad and put in half lettuce and half something and put in some cruciferous greens too, like arugula, bok choy, kale, cabbage, something else in there. And that combination with onion or scallion, you know, in other words, we're telling people that these foods, when they're included, they work synergistically in the diet to maximize, of course, normalize human immune function. I wrote a book called Superimmunity. But between me, me and you, 
It's just the immunity that people are supposed to have if they ate right. It's not super. It's everybody else has weakened immunity because they don't yeah. consume substances in their diet. You know what I mean? You, we're not supposed to be so vulnerable to viruses or so vulnerable to getting our joints fa fade away when we right. age. We're not supposed to have our lose our mind as we get older. We're not supposed to be in chronic pain with our digestive tract you know, and have reflux coming up and down, but whatever. So yeah, so the nutrient diet, so we're eating these high nutrient foods, having a lot of vegetables in four types, right? We're having both cruciferous raw and cooked and having non-cruciferous greens raw and cooked. There's like four types of green vegetables we're eating every day too. So we're eating vegetables, beans, nuts, seeds, be, you know, beans, fruits, we're eating all, even intact whole grains, not part of the G-bombs. We're eating a wide variety, a wide diversity of natural plants. And we're particularly not eating processed foods and we're getting our fats from nuts and seeds, not from oils. And we're, and the diet is SOS free sugar, salt, and oil free. And, and sugar, and don't forget, white flour is a sugar equivalent. White mm -hmm. flour is sugar. It enters the body as sugar and the same level of glycemic rush as if you had a, eating just food right out of a sugar cube, eating, eat a spoon and just spooning sugar into your mouth. Mm -hmm. People shove down sugar in white flour as part as more than half of the calories consumed in America, right? And they, then they, and then when you have fat in the meal with oil, not fat from nuts and seeds, because so they don't put enough fat in the bloodstream at one time, but fat from oil, it makes you more insulin resistant. So the insulin molecule doesn't work to get the sugar out of the blood. So any high glycemic diet, is the, the, the negative effects are magnified by using oil in the meal. But it's not just fat in the meal, oil in the blood or fat in the blood. It's also fat on the body. Mm. And saturated fat from animal products have more effects, more powerful effects to impair the function of the insulin receptor. So these keto people who say, look, I have to eat my turkey and my broccoli. If I have like a, an oatmeal with berries in it, my sugar will go too high. Well, yeah, the sugar is going to go too high because you've damaged your insulin receptors, all the saturated fat you're eating from all the coconut oil and all the other animal fats. And also you don't have the right microbiome, which can create the biofilm that absorbs glucose, utilizes it and slows the absorption of sugar into the bloodstream. So of course, if you eat a, some oatmeal, you're gonna have a glycemic response, whereas I'm not, because my diet is great and my biofilm is great. So the point is, is that a nutritarian diet looks at the whole picture and to make sure we have adequate exposure to all the nutrients humans need, particularly recognizing the vast amount of phytochemical and antioxidant deficiency from not eating enough vegetables, right? From not eating, you know, veg these things we're talking about, like onions, mushrooms, and vegetables, which give us tremendous micronutrient exposure. Well, as, as uh, you know, as we talk about all this, I'm just thinking about all the, all the stuff I'm going to be eating after our, uh, our, our talk today, because I'm just going <laughs> to Got my salad ready, some mushrooms, all, 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 all the things that you talk about. This has been wonderful. Two things I really didn't get to talk to you about, and and in maybe we'll save it for for a part two because this is all fascinating. The microbiome, the research on microbiome is unbelievable, and it is expanding at a rate. It's it's incredible to see how many people are talking about it. It's really getting into the mainstream. And I didn't talk to you about one of my favorite topics. You did bring up the microplastics briefly, but that is how all of these things affect our mitochondrial health. And those microplastics can lodge in your mitochondria kind of forever, and, and then you have dysfunctional mitochondria, so you can't produce the the energy. So I'm sure that your this, this diet absolutely supercharges your mitochondrial health, which is something I talk about, you know, kind of ad nauseum. It's a word that my wife limits me just to say, I can only say the word mitochondria a couple of times a day in the house because she's like, do you talk about anything else? And I said, well, why, why should we? So I, I think, you know, in closing, how can people really find you what's the best source website you want them to go to social media what if they were to start with one of your books there's so much to choose from and they should really read them all but if what's what's your favorite book what's the starter dr Furman book that if you just said yeah this is really going to get the lay person that has no clue what's going on you know just just getting in the habit of thinking about what we talked about today Thank you. Um, well, my website is drfurman.com and it's spelled F-U-H-R-M-A-N. So D-R-F-U-H-R-M-A-N.com. And I have a link there to my books and I have a, you know, a learning package. I even have a master class. They can learn the nutrient diet on videos. They can buy a book. Um, my book that I recommend is Eat for Life, even though I've written 13 books. 
they might as well read the most recent book. And then if they have an interest in reading an earlier book, like the end of diabetes, the end of heart disease, super immunity, or, you know, or fast food genocide, they're all recommended books, but they should start with the latest book with the most updated references, which is Eat for Life. And then of course I have a tab there for events that I've run and for my retreat here in San Diego, where some people are just have food addiction and they just need to get away and yeah. get away in a different environment and have them abstain from their triggers and be, and be forced to eat healthy for a while so they can reset themselves to go living and eating healthfully. And so I have people come to see me and stay here for a few months to, to you know, get on the program and to leave, lose weight and get, get their health back under my own personal supervision, usually because they need to be weaned off drugs, you know, when they're on, when they're here. For, but anyway, so that's this. So thanks for having me on. And I'd love to be on it again. We could talk about the omega-3 index, resistance starch, yes. the microbiome, zinc. There's so many things we could talk about and we could move on from this on, you know. Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, this has been wonderful. And I, and I absolutely, all I've been thinking as, as we've been talking here the last hour is, is we have to have a part two. I, I have, I have so many questions that I wrote down for you here. And I said, otherwise it's going to be a four or five hour show. So we'll right. just maybe do a part two. This has been wonderful. And and you really opened my eyes to some, you know, some new things, <laughs> you know, just as something that really would be fun is to have you and somebody who is a hardcore, you know, kind of meat meet person on to talk about kind of the differences between the diets and hash that out. I always love it on social media when kind of the, the vegan crowd gets, gets into it with the, with the keto crowd, those things go on forever and it goes back and forth and back and forth. It goes and nowhere, I'm, you know, it goes, it goes nowhere. It goes nowhere. It goes nowhere. It's a waste of time because yes. the data is there. I laid it out all in the book. I, I, I know studies and we can, you know, and they're going to deny every study. They're going to say, you know, oh, they're, they're going to take all these hundreds of thousands of researchers around the world who produced 30,000 research articles and say, I don't like that research. I just yeah, like, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, you, you can, yeah, you can pick and choose. And by the way, I'm not saying that a person with a certain medical condition could not be helped in some cases by a diet, if they're, let's say, lectin sensitive, if they're like have an allergy to certain plant material, sure, they have to get off the plant material if they're allergic to it. Yeah. But that doesn't mean a carnivore diet is good for people who don't have that allergy to that food. You know what I mean? Or the same thing with people with schizophrenia, that being on a, in a ketosis with schizophrenia can help them. You yes. know, or if a person has a seizure disorder, being in ketosis can help them. There are some unusual conditions where those diets are useful, but that doesn't mean we recommend them to the general population. They're just not safe for the general population. But in some medical instances, they can be useful to some people. Yeah, and I think that the nutrients that you're getting from what you talked about are absolutely must. I mean, you you have to have it. I mean, I, I could just tell you just from personally yeah. when I when I incorporate those, my levels of inflammation, I can tell that. I mean, it's easy. It it and only and honestly, what you said before, if I, for example, if I traveled and I got off the wagon and I came back and I really had a clean diet and I had a lot of vegetables and 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 green leafy stuff, all the stuff you talked about. In one week, it's just dramatic. I'm a different person already yeah. just in one week. Whereas when when you when you do those other things and you're having pizza or whatever you're eating, you feel terrible. But people get so used to it, it's almost they're in that kind of permanent dysthymic, I don't feel good state, you no, know, all, all this other stuff. And and the truth is we are both witness and you you've dedicated your entire life to it. Me, just because I talk to, you know, I I, I see dozens and dozens of patients a week general population is unhappy and they don't feel well and these yeah. simple steps i didn't say it's easy but it, they're simple can make the difference between living a prosperous healthy life where you care about your fellow man you care about making the world a better place you care about all these other things it's so ex i mean it's so inspiring having talked to you today i mean you've got me i'm a pretty you know i'm a pretty fired up guy but just talking to you i'm at a, just a different level right now i just want to go and share this you know with the world so thank you so much for you know the the appearance today we look forward to having you on again and thanks everybody for joining us with Dr. Furman today. This has been incredible on another episode of Wellness at the Speed of Light. We'll see you next time. And once we have this one out into, into, the, uh, into the world, we will, we will announce our part two sometime later. See you guys next time. Mm -hmm.